Good afternoon and welcome to this talk um, at the UCT Virtual Open Day on your UCT undergraduate um, application and admission. It's really good to have you. My name is Carl Herman. Uh, I'm Director of Admissions and I'm accompanied by Marcel Maggot, who is the Applications Process Manager. She's in the background for now, but she is um, fielding your questions and responding to them um, in the Q&A bar. Um, may I ask you then uh, to please be ready to submit your questions uh, in that area, in that space throughout the, the talk. And uh, Marcel will attempt to uh, answer as many as she can uh, during our few minutes together. And perhaps I can ask as a special favor that you, that you uh, and to get used to that question and answer bar where you may remain anonymous if you choose. Uh, why don't you let us know which school you are at and where the school is? So if you can tell us what the name of the school and the city, uh, that will give us a good uh, uh, idea of, of, of where you're applying from, where you're attending school and so on. Uh, so thanks again and uh, let's get started. So in these few minutes, um, <clears throat> we will look at uh, your application um, to, the, uh, to, to uh, UCT for 2023 admission, <coughs> excuse me, um, the admission process thereafter and some related uh, important events that surround those two processes. Um, that's really important. Uh, this, of course, is a presentation in a suite of uh, some 47 presentations today at the event, the live event and the online event. And, um, and I hope you've been able to participate in many of the other presentations as well. If you have not been able to get to all the ones you really want to get to, we will over the next uh, couple of weeks be publishing uh, uh, your application, uh, rather the presentations on our on our YouTube channel. So look out for the UCT Admissions YouTube channel and we'll be sharing uh, many of those uh, presentations with you there so you're able to catch up. Um, great, let's get started. I want to um, I want to get to these elements as soon as possible and I hope you are able to um, to see the screen and, uh, and that we can get underway. So these are a few slides, as I said, which will help guide us through um, through the processes and I want to start by uh, looking at one or two key resources which we believe every applicant should have access to and should hold on to. And the first one is the directions. Um, oh, uh, let me, I believe there may be a small issue with my, the document. So let me go back. I apologize. Let me share this. I hope that is um, visible now. I certainly do. And let's start with those resources again. Um, the, these are these are key resources which we believe every applicant uh, should have access to throughout the process of applying, throughout uh, the consideration of the admission, and um, and certainly up to the point where they may choose to enroll in 2023. Uh, the first is the directions for undergraduate applicants, a, a document, a booklet which contains uh, key directions, key information for the entire process. Uh, supplemented uh, by the flagship document uh, and publication for this process, which is the undergraduate prospectus, contains key policy issues around admission, all details relating to admission criteria, what it is you require uh, for each and every program. So those two documents uh, um, together uh, really we believe uh, are key resources uh, insofar as reference documents are concerned for your processes. And then uh, please hold on to all the correspondence you may receive from UCT, particularly from um, the faculty offices uh, to which you um, may have applied, well, you, you applied for admission to the programs and you will receive really key correspondence from faculty offices relating to your application. Um, put them in a safe place, refer to them from time to time. They often contain a really key information which you'll find very, very useful. Now, let's start with your application and uh, some of you may have submitted applications already. 
Um, some of you may be considering one and others may uh, you know, be in the process of completing one. But your online application should reach us between 1 April and 31 July. Uh, that's a four month window after which we do not permit any further applications. So please uh, pay attention to that, uh, that window, those dates, those are key dates. If you intend to submit an application anyway, we suggest that you do so earlier rather than later, because that will give you an opportunity to uh, include all the components uh, uh, of your application and update them as it becomes appropriate to do so. Um, when you apply, you will apply for either one or two program choices, and there are some rules relating to uh, which program choices you may take in combination with others, how many you may choose from respective faculties. I'm not going to go into those details here. They are available in the various uh, platforms and documents that we speak to. Um, but there are some rules and, and, and limitations um, around those choices, but you are permitted two choices. And um, it's important that those two choices, uh, those applications to two different programs are considered concurrently at the same time, and they're not considered sequentially. And it's possible uh, that you may obtain some form of offer for one or both uh, um, at the, you know, concurrently. And, and, and so please uh, be aware of that and know that you've got to respond to, um, to whatever is required for each of your program choices. Your application, which you submit to us uh, online, will also contain an application for student accommodation, should you wish to be admitted to housing. So there's no separate application for that, but there is no application to UCT for need-based financial aid. So uh, the kind of financial aid awarded uh, by uh, the National Student Financial Aid Scheme for South African applicants is not done through a UCT application. That is a separate application that's done uh, via the NISFAS website uh, directly. And then last uh, point on this slide about your application is that when you uh, submit your application, you may be required to submit your NBT registration number. Now, there are again, very particular requirements uh, for some of our applicants relating to the NBTs, but most of our undergraduate applicants will be required to write the national benchmark tests. And the registration number for that, um, uh, that setting, whenever you choose to write the test, that registration number is required when uh, applying to UCT and when submitting your application. And then the other key and, and a point in, in the application cycle is 31 August. So this, this is one month after the closing date for applications. Um, and it's a due date by which uh, you need to submit any requests for changes to your program choices. I said earlier that you are permitted to apply for either one or two program choices, but should you choose to change them for whatever reason you have until 31 August to do so, thereafter, uh, that is no longer your prerogative to do so. So 31 August is the closing date for any changes to your program choices and you submit them in one or two ways, but um, preferably by email or, uh, or through student self-service, which you'll be informed about when you apply. So now I want to turn from the application process, submitting an application to the admission process, which is the part where we consider you for an offer of admission or not. So firstly, uh, let me point out uh, that the basis for admission, the reason we will choose to admit you uh, will be based on your final school leaving results. So if you're a National Senior Certificate candidate, those final NSC results will determine whether or not we can admit to you into the programs of your choice. Um, ordinarily, we will not uh, admit you nor deny you based on interim exams, except of course for early conditional offers, which we'll come to in a moment. But the actual process of admitting you to studies in 2023 will depend on your final results. Um, for tertiary uh, or transferring applicants uh, who are studying elsewhere or even at UCT, uh, such uh, consideration will not only be your, your final school leaving results, but also 
your academic results from your university. Uh, if you were studying in 22, for example, you'd need to have submitted your final 2022 results. So both your school and your, your academic record will determine that. In addition to your academic record, uh, we also require your um, uh, your national benchmark test results and they must meet uh, specified and published levels. And these levels, as I said, are in the prospectus, they detail there. So the MBT performance is very important, um, except for applicants to, uh, to the Faculty of Engineering and the Built Environment uh, who do not need to write the MBTs if you're applying to no other programs. So if you have an EBE application for one of your choices, but the other choice is in a different faculty, then you would need to write the national benchmark tests as required by the other choice. But if you're applying only to, to programs in EBE or engineering in the built environment, there is no need to write the national benchmark tests. So apart from your academic record, your school record and or your tertiary record um, and your MBT results where they are relevant, you may be required to submit additional information or additional documents to us. Um, or perform um, an audition where it's a, perform uh, a performing arts program. Uh, so please look out for information about that from the department uh, in the prospectus and elsewhere you'll be informed of the need to submit different parts um, or different elements to your uh, application to be considered for admission. So those form the basis for your admission. Um, let's get back to early offer. So even though what we just discussed will form the basis for being admitted in 2023, we do consider applicants for early conditional offers. And early conditional offers are exactly that. They are made throughout the course of the year uh, based on evidence uh, such as the ones I'll speak to in a moment um, that, that will allow us to make a conditional offer to an applicant. And a conditional offer um, really means that, of course, there are conditions attached. It does not mean admission in 2023, but it is important for some categories of applicants. For example, uh, international applicants will need at least a conditional offer in order to access a study visa. And those are made on preliminary results uh, as the ones I described in the slide or um, even predicted scores for non-South African um, qualifications as well as your performance in national benchmark tests. Right, so I want to look quickly at some elements of the timeline uh, throughout this application and admission process, um, and, and, um, uh, and some of which I've already dealt with, but just to give you a sense of how these all fit together, let's go through these fairly briefly. Now, be aware that the faculties who communicate with you may inform you of other due dates or other commitments related to time in this entire continuum. So I'm not speaking to those particular ones. I'm speaking here to the relatively broad issues in your timeline. So as I said, applications are open. Uh, just to give you a sense, the first national benchmark test session happens in the middle of May. So even though you may register for a test now, uh, the first session happens on 14 May. National benchmark tests are offered throughout the course of the year on, uh, in, uh, on paper, uh, pencil and paper tests in physical venues or online. And when you register, you'll, uh, you'll encounter a range of possible dates and venues and modes uh, with which to write the test. Um, but I'll speak to one or two of the limitations related to UCT in a moment. Um, as I said already, applications close at the end of July, and I've already spoken to the closing date of 31 August for program changes. So here's the immediate and key MBT uh, limitation related to us, or your application to UCT, and that is that even though the MBTs are offered beyond this point, if you wish to be admitted to UCT, you must have written the MBTs no later than 15 October this year, no later than that. That's a very important date. Let me quickly add something else that's not on the timeline, and that is that if you wish to uh, be considered for an early conditional offer um, for any program in the Faculty of Health Sciences, you must have written the MBTs not by 15 October, but by 31 July. So that's a really critical date uh, for all health sciences applicants who wish to be considered for early conditional offers. The MBTs last time for us on 15 uh, October. 
end of October is the closing date for all supplementary information, such as, uh, you know, all your grade 11 or, 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 or grade 12 preliminary examination results, predicted scores, application fees that may be outstanding, stuff like that. 31 October is the final date for that submission. And then for international applicants, it's really important to note that by 15 November 2022, you need to have secured a conditional offer at the very least. Uh, if we if you, we do not have evidence uh, and you're not performing strongly enough for whatever reason, the evidence is not there to make such a conditional offer by mid-November, uh, mid uh, we have no choice but to decline your application. And that Re, uh, the reason for that relates to um, the time required to uh, procure a study visa, uh, which is quite time consuming. And if you're going to make it to us by the first semester, we'll have to have you um, get an offer and an offer letter, particularly by mid-November. The end of December is the due date for, uh, for tertiary results and non-South African um, school results, uh, you know, IB diplomas and, 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 and the like. And there's one exception, one or two exceptions to that, and that is that um, CAIE and ZIMSEC applicants, or oh, I think I may have had a glitch, CAIE and ZIMSEC applicants um, have until 15 January uh, to to get their final results to us. So that really is the timeline. One last point about final results. The NSC applicants do not need to submit final results to us. They are simply um, they are simply sent to us by your examining authorities, and they include the Department of Basic Education, uh, the Independent Examination Board, and the South African um, uh, Comprehensive Assessment Institute, Sakai. Those three examining authorities send your results to us directly for the NSC because they all offer the NSC. Um, and, and so there's no need for you to email your NSC results to us. Um, one or two closing announcements. Firstly, we are absolutely open for business. We are open on campus each day. Um, we are open for campus tours if you come to visit us. And certainly if you wish to be um, to be uh, to be visited in person, uh, you know, or, 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 or to visit us in person and have an interview, you're welcome to do so. Our colleagues are also going out to schools and visiting them in person. So you are absolutely welcome to come onto campus and, and come particularly to the middle campus where the admissions office uh, is uh, situated um, and make the necessary res a reservation for a, a tour or an interview. And in addition, we also, of course, offer online services. So you're from out of town and you have no plans to come to Cape Town, you are welcome to book an interview with us uh, for you and your family. Uh, online and we'll do it for you privately free, gratis and for nothing, of course. There's no need to consider any charge for any of that. Um, and similarly, we do uh, presentations. Our colleagues do presentations to schools uh, online via different platforms all the time. So those are some of the services that you are welcome and you're encouraged to make use of. Um, I'm now going to uh, ask you for your questions and we're going to deal with some of your questions in a moment. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing this so that we can do so. Uh, let's just. Right, so Marcel, have you been getting uh, lots of questions? Perhaps you want to give us an idea uh, of, of, of whether any of our attendees uh, identify themselves and their schools. Yes, thank you, Carl. I've, I've actually been publishing the schools that are in the talk, so we've, oh, we've got quite a few, a, a nice range. I think there's the, even some international attendees as well. Fantastic. Um, but Carl, I've got a question yes. from someone. They they say, I'm homeschooled and use the Cambridge International Curriculum. How does one apply with this metric equivalent and does one need to get it certified by a certain body? Hi, thanks. That's a very, uh, very good question. Um, so let's deal with a couple of components of your question. Firstly, you are homeschooled. So the fact that you are homeschooled it does not prejudice you in any way. I want to just make that clear. Secondly, you are a Cambridge Assessment International Education candidate, a CAIE candidate. Um, that means that you're obviously not doing the National Senior Certificate. So firstly, there's a comment I want to make to you and to uh, applicants such as you. 
who are not NSC candidates. And that is, as you I'm sure already know, uh, you need to be able to qualify for matriculation exemption. So that's the first requirement. There's a statutory requirement before we can consider you for admission to ECT, and that is that we must ensure that you qualify, you're eligible for matriculation exemption. Um, secondly, uh, you then simply need to meet the requirements for Cambridge applicants as they are published in our prospectus. Um, and once you meet those requirements, you will be um, eligible for uh, for consideration and, 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 and admission if your application uh, um, you know, is competitive enough. Um, thirdly, we do receive we do receive results for Cambridge applicants direct from CIE from the CIE. However, um, we only receive results for applicants who have authorized the CIE to release results to us. Um, so please, uh, the, uh, when I say CIE, I should be saying CIE direct, the part of uh, Cambridge assessment that deals with the examination and issuing of results. So CIE direct um, will issue us the results, but only if you have authorized them to do so. So please inquire how you are able to authorize them to do so, and we should have no problem receiving your results. Failing that, you can contact us once you have them, and we'll deal with them directly. Okay, Masong? Great, thanks so much, Carl. Um, next question. They wanting to know, can you send in a birth certificate instead of an ID? So, uh, you, you are certainly, so uh, let me first go to the reason for this question. When you apply online, you are required to upload a copy of your ID document if you are a South African citizen or permanent resident. Um, uh, and if you are an international applicant, uh, a copy of your passport. If you do not have an ID document for whatever reason, you are able to, in the interim, submit a birth certificate. However, uh, you will need to submit to us your South African ID document, which officially identifies you um, once you receive it. So we presume that you've either lost it or it, you are awaiting it from the Department of Home Affairs. Uh, so you, you are able to submit a birth certificate in the interim, um, but you must let us have your SAID document before you are able to register, assuming you are admitted. Okay. Right, next question, Carl. Um, what does a second major mean? Will I be getting two degrees and why do I have to major in two courses? Ah, um, that's another really interesting and really important question. So there's a preliminary comment I want to make very briefly again, and that is that each degree program in each of the faculties, as they're offered by the faculties, uh, um, you know, in their various guises. Firstly, they have different durations. Uh, the, the minimum duration of these degree programs will vary from um, uh, uh, three year for a degree program from three years to uh, even six years, as long as that. So there are different durations, but very importantly, there are different rules attached to each program and the curriculum uh, related or associated with that program. So that's very important, the curriculum associated with the, with the program. And in some programs, you will find that you require two majors in order to qualify for graduation, two majors. Uh, and um, that, that, those, that requirement, those two major requirements are simply requirements related to the rules for the curriculum associated with that program. There may be very different sets of, of curricula in, um, in, in other programs and different sets of rules completely in other programs. Um, you do not qualify for two degrees. Uh, it, your, because your, 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 your qualification, the degree and the qualification which you, uh, which you achieve once you graduate will be, uh, for example, a Bachelor of, of, of Social Sciences. And that Bachelor of Social Sciences will be the um, will be the qualification. But there's a curriculum that you, of course, pursued courses you've passed in order to achieve the BSOC Science. So, no, there are not two uh, degrees for which you qualify. There remains just one, but uh, you need to do two majors because of the cu curriculum rules. OK. Thanks, Carl. Um, the next question is around the gap year. So it says, yes. if I took a gap year, is my grade 11 report still required if I received my NSC results? Ah. 
So that's a, that's a very common but very important question. If you are not in grade 12 at the moment, you've already completed grade 12, we will not be considering you for a conditional offer. We will be considering you for admission, of course, and in which case uh, such admission will only be a firm offer. We only require your final results because you've got final results. The majority of our undergraduate applicants are currently finishing school, which is why we require the preliminary results. So that's very simple. Thanks. Um, thanks, Colin. We've got a few questions around the application fees. So I have published the, the, the details about um, where to find the details, but um, the question is when should you pay your application fee? Right, so the application fee is due when you apply. <laughs> After you apply and you receive from us correspondence with your campus ID or applicant number, it's a nine character alphanumeric Number, number, so to speak. Once you get that number, you use that as a reference to pay your application fee. So it's it's, it's due fairly immediately. Um, uh, yeah, not when you register as a student. I can see some of the comments, uh, Marcel, and uh, I can see there's uh, Midstream College, uh, someone from Sachs, Wickham Collegiate. Uh, there's a homeschooling candidate. There's a whole range. So I'm I'm just scrolling. Holy Family, Brockbun. There's a whole range. Um, um, and some local one from Spine Road, Plumstead, and of course, uh, a colleague, uh, a school I once visited in Winter Calls from Paul's College. So they're all here. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's good to have you. Let's, let me just say this before the actual time comes to an end, so which is going to happen in four minutes, three minutes. Um, the, the, when we get to a quarter to two, uh, we will we will terminate the broadcast of this presentation, but uh, Marcel and I will continue to respond to questions in the chat that have already been submitted. OK, those that have already been submitted, we will um, do our best to get through all of them, particularly the ones that haven't already been answered in the previous one. Anyway, Marcel, have you got any other any others I can deal with very quickly? Um, one last question, Carl. This is from mm -hmm. Reese. He's ask, he or she, sorry, is asking, I've applied for a selection course, medicine, and I also applied for a BSc. Should I get accepted for my BSc? Do I accept that until I have confirmation of my medicine application status, or can I only accept one of my choices? Is that from Reese, Mazon? Yes, it is. Very good question, Reese. I said earlier that um, your two programs are considered concurrently. So if you are admitted, uh, let's say you receive a conditional offer for your BSc, you are permitted to go ahead and, and accept that offer. That acceptance has no bearing whatsoever on your consideration for any other program, whether it's medicine or anything else. Indeed, if you receive an offer for medicine, you may go ahead and accept that offer as well. So you may have two accepted conditional offers. There's only one point in the year when uh, we will come to you, let me rephrase that, Marcel will come after you particularly, and that is <laughs> after we finalize firm offers. So typically late in January, once we finalize firm offers, we've received your NSE results, we've completed all the offer, the admissions processes, and some applicants have two firm offers. Uh, Reese, if you have two firm offers at that point, uh, even though you may have accepted both, we will give you a short window of time in which to make your choice between the two, because we will not want you to have two firm offers prior to the start of the registration process. I hope that clears it up, Russell. Yes, thanks so much, Cole. I'm not sure if you want to take one more question. Sure. We've got a few seconds left. Yes. Um, okay. So, someone, um, I'm sorry, answer that one already. Um, let me just find the one that I was looking for. After receiving the NEC results, how long after that will I be notified of the outcome of my application? Right, so I presume you're referring to the final NEC results. So, That's correct. Yeah. Right, when you, when, we, when you receive your final NEC results, we typically take no longer than 72 hours to complete all of our processing. Um, this year, for example, in, 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 I forget what the dates were earlier in January, but this year, uh, we, the results were released to the public on the Thursday morning and by the Friday night we had completed all our undergraduate offers. So we tried to wrap that up in a very short space of time. Um, 
Um, and of course, it, it's, a, it's a key event that fits into a broader, you know, a broader calendar of events and so on. But uh, it will happen within two to three days and no more. So I'm going to leave it there for our uh, broadcast uh, quest questions and answers, and we'll tackle some of these others in a moment. But before we do so, let me um, thank everybody who's been in attendance. We've got several hundred attendees. Let me th uh, thank everyone who's, who, who's, who's spent some time with us. If you wish to view the answers to the written questions that we've received, you may not have seen that. You may not have seen them yet. So we can see questions that have been submitted to us, but we haven't yet responded to that. If you wish to see um, the responses to them, it's important that you remain here um, in the meeting and don't leave it. Um, otherwise, we will thank you very much. Uh, we will stick around, but the broad broadcast will end and we'll continue to um, answer some of the questions in writing. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of Open Day and we hope to see your application very soon. Thank you and bye-bye.